Alrighty, well, welcome back to the Sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testaments. Today we will be finishing up the Old Testament, and we'll be passing our halfway point. Uh, tonight we are looking at uh, prophecies, prophecies and other types in the Old Testament concerning the sacrifice of Christ. I do have quite a bit I'd like to uh, cover tonight. I guess first we'll start with the first prophecy about the sacrifice of Christ. And when we say the sacrifice of Christ, we primarily mean the suffering and death of Christ. But of course, his resurrection is important to that, and his whole life really was a sacrifice. So anyone happen to find that particular passage? Uh, Brother Larry? John chapter 3. What would you say? Yeah, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Uh, we'll turn there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. As we all probably know, this is where Eve had eaten of the fruit and gave to Adam, and he had willfully sinned and taken and eaten, and God was giving out the punishments. It says, when he got to the serpent, though, he says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I remember me and Adam talking about... Most people say the serpent was Satan, and... At the very least, it seems that he was controlled by Satan. And this is where the association first begins. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, we won't turn there, but verses 11 through 19 describe Satan and say that he was in Eden, the garden of God. He's called, I think, the king of Tyre there. But here there's really a, both a literal and a spiritual meaning, it seems, to this passage. So obviously the serpent now does slither, if you will, on its belly. I don't know if it had feet before this and walked around. I assume it must have. I know the, the fall affected a lot of things. You know, I wonder sometimes what the lion was like before the fall, what all these other carnivorous creatures were like that, that feed on dead animals or kill their prey. Isaiah says that when I don't remember exactly how it's worded but he tells us that one day there will be a day when the lion shall eat straw with the lamb I assume the serpent uh, was much different creature than we know as know now And I will put enmity, verse 15 says, between thee and the woman, and between her, thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now obviously man, and it seems women especially, have a dislike for snakes. Mm -hmm. But in a spiritual way, he's, he's talking about enmity between Satan and Christ, or between, at the very least, Satan and all his people and God's people. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Christ bruised the head of Satan. Really we find in three different ways he's bruised. On the cross he bruised his head. And this bruising the head is a really implies a mortal wound if you will. As the bruising of the heel is not a mortal wound. But Hebrews 2.14 says that through death he might destroy the one who had power of death, that is the devil. Right. Romans 16.20 tells us that God will again bruise Satan. I believe that's at the coming of Christ when he's bound for a thousand years. And then Revelation 20.10 tells us that he is will one day be forever cast in the lake of fire. And that'll be his ultimate defeat. I mean, certainly he's already defeated now, and I think he knows his time is 
limited. But Satan and his seed, they would only bruise the heel of Christ. Certainly they, they put him to death there on the cross, if I could say the way they, they crucified him. Certainly he gave up his own life. But that wasn't a mortal wound, was it? Or he, you know, I don't know what Satan thought when Christ cried out, it is finished, and gave up the ghost. If he thought, oh, I've won the victory. If he, God was wrong back there in Eden. But three days later, he rose again. You know, and also there's, most people associate this, that speaks of the virgin birth. That's what I'm where it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now, certainly Christ was to be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14 tells us, And a virgin shall conceive, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Which it, the New Testament tells us, being interpreted as God with us. So Christ would come. There's really both his death, his excuse me, his death and his birth are prophesied in here. And, you know, there's over 300 prophecies they say regarding Christ. Now, obviously, we can't look at all of those, and we're focusing primarily on his suffering and his death. So next, let's go on to. Uh, Isaiah chapter, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 12. We'll go to Isaiah after this. Here we have the Passover. Look at a few verses here. I'm sure we all are familiar with at least the feast of the Passover. When Exodus chapter 12 verse 3, here God speaks to Moses and gives him instructions for the very first Passover speaking unto all the congregation of Israel saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for an house and if the household be too little for the lamb let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls every man according to his eating shall you make your count for the lamb so each house was to have a lamb for themselves but if the house be too little, it says, there was a small family they could share with their neighbor. You know, as we'll see, this was that none of it would be wasted. Verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall make it out from the sheep or from the goats. So a young male lamb without blemish. You know, the perfect picture of Christ, isn't it? As we've seen, without blemish means to be you know perfect, spotless, without sin is what the type is he said you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats so it seems that the, a goat was allowed if the person didn't have a sheep here but there wasn't any other provision here it had to be one of these it couldn't be a bull it couldn't be the meat offering it couldn't be any other it had to be a lamb without blemish and verse 6 it says and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Doesn't that point perfectly to Christ, how the whole of Israel killed him? Well, I know, as I said, Christ gave his life willingly, but they put him there on the cross. They are fully responsible for his death. Let's go on to verse 7 here. It says, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two po or two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat. Well, here we see a, a picture of the cross, don't we? And really a strong, very strong picture for particular redemption. It was only applicable right. to those that were in the house. Right. And those that didn't have the blood applied, as we'll see, they were not included in that where they, they were not passed over as it says rather the death angel came to their house and the firstborn was slain right. verse 8 says and they shall eat the flesh that it, they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs they shall eat it <clears throat> verse 9 eat not of it raw nor sodden all of it or not sodden at all with water but roast with fire his head with his legs 
and with the putrence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. You know, fire indicates the sufferings of Christ. It wasn't to be raw, it wasn't to be boiled with water, but to be roasted with fire. And we see unleavened bread associated here with it, which we know indicates there was no sin, no false teaching as we looked at before. And they were eating it with bitter herbs, it says. You know, there was certainly nothing pleasant, if you will, about the death of Christ. Was it? it was very bitter in his sufferings, in his death. And again, we see it was to be with roasted with fire, but here it says his head with his legs and with the putrescence thereof, and let nothing of it remain to the morning. You know, every last piece was to be eaten, the, even the intestines and the internal organs. Every last piece of Christ was used up on the cross. You know, not a single of it, bit of it was wasted. All of it was consumed, if you will. Right. <coughs> and let's go on to verse 11 here through verse 14. It says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on, and your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in, the, in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And the Jews were prepared to be prepared to leave Egypt, weren't they? Right. Well, right after this, they were going to get up and leave. As I pointed out in one class we had before, uh, Egypt is a type of sin. It's called the house of bondage in several places in scriptures. And just as the Israelites left Egypt after the Passover, so are we to leave sin after our Passover, which is Christ. Verse 12 says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt I will execute, or, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the house where ye are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you. Amen. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So God will pass over when he saw the blood applied. You know, we, there's a song about that, isn't there? I will pass over you. But it's just the same as he does with Christ. When the blood's been applied, he, spiritually speaking, passes over us. Judgment will not come our way. You know, just as the plagues and the judgment didn't come upon Israel if they had the blood applied. But you can be sure if there was any of Israel that didn't apply the blood, they weren't part that was passed over. You know, just because they were associated with Israel didn't mean they were safe. They had to do as God required. They had to have the blood applied. And just because we're you know, associated with the church or have a godly family doesn't mean God will pass over us unless the blood is applied. Verse 14 will conclude here in Exodus, and it says, In this day sh shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it to a feast to the Lord through out your generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. You know, we see it was to be a memorial, and we see that also in Christ, when we, in the Lord's Supper, that we keep that as a memorial of His death. Right. Well, the New Testament describes Him as the Passover. He was our Passover. The Passover really was completely fulfilled in Christ, wasn't it? And it says, You shall keep it a feast, O Lord, throughout your generations. You'll keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. You know, there's some here who say, Well, here you go. We're still to keep the Old Testament feast and laws and such. But no, we keep it really through the Lord's Supper, only the Lord's table. Right. That is our remembrance of our Passover, which is Christ. Let's go on over to. Numbers now. Numbers chapter 21. I know I may be running through this a little faster than we have been, but I do have a lot I want to look at tonight. Uh, Numbers chapter 21, verses 6 through 9. This is, for lack of a better word, the story of the fiery serpents in Israel. Verse 6 says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. No, he sent them because they were sinful. Right. 
the previous verse tells us that they complained against Moses and God himself. You know, they said, you brought us out here in the wilderness to die, and we load this light bread. They were not happy with, they were not satisfied, if you will, or content with what God had provided for them. So the Lord sent this judgment upon them, these fiery serpents. It says, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee, praying to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. You know, figuratively speaking, all have been bitten by this fiery serpent, haven't they? And all will die, except they, as we see here, turn to the one that's lifted up. You know, they said, We have sinned. Most people today want to admit that they have sinned, though, will they? When I don't think we need to necessarily admit that we are sinners, but when the Holy Spirit convicts you, you'll realize you are a sinner, won't you? Right. That you have sinned against the Almighty. Verse 8 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that has bidden, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had been any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Well, here the solution was to put a serpent on a pole and lift it up, and whoever looked upon it would live. Well, Christ himself references this event in John 3.14 and as well as John 12.32-34. We won't turn there, but he said the Son of Man must be lifted up. He said, if, if I, the Son of Man, be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Right. We must look to Christ and live to, even today. Just as the serpent was lifted up, so was Christ lifted up upon the cross. You know, there could have been some that were bitten and didn't look. But they certainly wouldn't live, would they? Just as without looking to Christ, we will not live spiritually. Let's go uh, on over to Isaiah now. Probably Isaiah 52, probably some familiar scriptures here. We'll look in the last part of 52 and go on into chapter 53. This is one of the most often quoted prophecies regarding Christ and his sufferings and death. Really, it begins at verse 13 of chapter 52. It says, Behold, my servant or servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Now, certainly Christ was very high and lifted up, wasn't he? Right. He said that his time was to be glorified was now. Verse 14 says, And as many were astonished at thee, or astonished, at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. You know, his through his sufferings, he was disfigured more than any person ever had been. Right. Some suppose he didn't even look as a man anymore. Certainly, he, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, he suffered, knowing what was coming. And then physically, as he was beaten, as he was mocked and made fun of, slapped with the crown of thorns put upon him, and then given the cross to bear, and then obviously the crucifixion itself, all of which took a very large toil on his physical appearance. Right. So that it says he was marred, he was disfigured, says, more than any man, his form more than, in, than the sons of men. Verse 15 says, So shall he sprinkle many nations, the king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which shall, or had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Certainly his, his blood has been sprinkled on the altar of God for many. Right. So there he shall sprinkle many nations. You know, it didn't. It wasn't just for the Jews, was it? It was right. for all nations, really. Whether you were from Africa or Asia or Europe or 
Native American, Central American, whatever it may be, South American, to the far reaches of the world, Christ's sacrifice reached those far places. When it says, I think the last part of that verse is saying that the gospel will be preached to all the world. It says, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Had it not been for Christ coming and dying, there was millions and millions that would not know about the God of Israel. Is it? I know they had a testimony. They were not to go into all the world and preach the gospel as we are. Really, it was confined just to Israel and the few that God let in that weren't part of Israel. But with thanks be to God, his blood shall sprinkle many nations now. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 53, he says, Who hath believed our report, and whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You know, not all will believe. In fact, not very many will truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this is quoted in Romans 10, 16, as well as John 12, 37 through 40. That not, in fact, they couldn't believe unless God opened their eyes, what John chapter 12 tells us. Who hath believed our report, or, whom, or to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? See, it has to be revealed unto you. Right. As Christ said to Peter, Flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you. No, God has to reveal the truth of Christ to us, the person of Christ to us, just as he did to the Samaritan woman at the well, as Brother Larry brought out Sunday. Uh, verse 2 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and a, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And Christ was not necessarily an attractive person in the flesh. It says there was no beauty that we should desire him. There's no no form nor comeliness. I mean, literally, he has he had nothing good about his appearance. Right. I don't think he was this long-haired, particularly good-looking fellow that most make him out to be. Right. No, there was no beauty that we should desire him. Remember the altar when we looked at that back in Exodus. It was not to be outwardly attractive either. God's, in fact, I think when speaking of, I don't know if it was Saul, Samuel was told not to look on his outward appearance, but to look on his inward appearance, if you will. God looks upon the hearts, not the outward appearance. God's not necessarily uh, concerned with what things look to the flesh. Verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we did hit, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Well, Christ was definitely rejected of men. Uh, John 1 11 tells us he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And by and large, he's rejected of the masses today, even. Now, there's a lot that will have a person they call Jesus that they believed in or they believe in but yet they don't believe in the Jesus of Isaiah chapter 53 do they? Right. They believe in the one that they've made up one that sounds good to them. Right. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne verse 4 our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken spitting of God and afflicted. No, even us as his people didn't openly receive him, did we? Right. But yet he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, he took all our troubles and cares. And when, a literal m meaning of this is that he took even took our sickness and infirmities. Right. And the New Testament does make provision for us if we are sick. Right. To call on the elders of the church and to anoint him with oil and to pray over him. That's another topic for another time. But Christ bore our griefs and our sorrows. And it says, Yet we did esteem him stricken, spitting of God and afflicted. You know many today many think that he was punished by God, if you will, but really he was punished on our behalf. It was our burdens that were upon him. Right. That's the next verse, verse five, we'll go on to 
begins to tell us how it was it was for us it was our transgressions of our sins of our iniquities verse 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed Amen. see there was nothing in Christ that was wrong he was the lamb without blemish right. it was our transgressions our breaking of God's law not his it was our iniquities our our sin our evil our guilt that was upon him even the it says here the chastisement of our peace the, that which was to bring about our peace with God even that was upon him it says I did think it was interesting that this word wounded here could also mean pierced but certainly he was pierced wasn't he right. and here we see that bruised again he was bruised for our iniquities in a sense, he was crushed, but yet it was not a, an eternal bruising, was it? Right. He was the. He suffered greatly, but yet he was not defeated there on the cross. You know, though he was beaten, yet he says we are healed. You know, all we like sheep have gone astray. Verse six says we have turned every one to his own way. The Lord had laid a, on him the iniquity of us all here seems to be a recurring theme here doesn't it that it was our iniquity that it was our sin our transgressions we were the ones doing our own thing and yet Christ died for us right. we were, were like sheep we had gone astray yet Christ came to save the sheep that were lost didn't he in fact Luke says and whether it's Mark or Matthew also he came to seek and save that which was lost so we were lost sheep wandering on our own trying to do our own thing well, sheep on their own don't do so well though do they Good. yet even though we were in such a condition it says he laid on the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all mm-hmm. verse 7 and the first part of verse 8 is where uh Ethiopian eunuch was reading from Acts chapter 8 verse 32 and 33 tells us that it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb so he opened it not his mouth but through all this Christ didn't complain he became completely obedient to the will of God right. in fact Hebrews 5 verse 8 tells us that he learned obedience now, I don't think that means he learned it as he didn't know what obedience was but for the first time he had experienced complete submissive obedience right. and even in all of that it says he opened out his mouth he didn't complain he didn't murmur he just submitted himself completely to what God would have for him mm-hmm. verse 8 says he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation Certainly he was arrested and judged, wasn't he? Before Pilate and Herod, as well as the Jews. And he was put to death, as it says here, for he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. It was for the transgression of God's people that he was cut off out of the land. Right. Put to death on the cross. Well, again, we can make an argument for particular redemption here because it was for... God's people right. it wasn't just for everybody one thing I didn't mean meant to mention when we were back in Genesis it said that the woman had a seed and that the serpent had a seed mm-hmm. we saw I think it was last week Eli's sons were called the sons of Belial which is the sons of Satan Cain is described by Peter as being of the wicked one and when you look at the parable of the tares and wheat, uh, it says the wheat were the good seed. They were the sons of the, of the kingdom. For the tares, they were the children of the wicked one. Right. I know Satan doesn't li- have literal children that he's birthed, but certainly spiritually he does. Right. Christ, in fact, himself called the Pharisees, or he told them, you are your father the devil. So that's a whole other can of worms we could open up on what exactly is 
the seed or the children of Satan. You can be sure there are some that are God's and some that are Satan's. And Christ died for God's people. Verse number 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He was buried in the rich man's tomb, wasn't he? Joseph, Arimathea. In that he was buried with the wicked and the rich. But yet he had done no violence. It says he was still the perfect Lamb of God, even through all of that. It says, Neither was any deceit in his mouth. You know, not one drop of wickedness was found in Christ. Right. In fact, Pilate himself said, you know, I don't find any fault in this man. Mm-hmm. Of course, he wasn't much of one to stick up for him, but we all know that was part of the purpose and plan of God, of course. I don't know that any of us in the same situation would have been perfectly sinless, would we? He was falsely accused. He was arrested. He was beaten unnecessarily, sentenced to death for no wrong that he had done, and yet he remained perfectly sinless. (laughs) Let's go on to verse 10. (coughs) Verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So even though he was perfectly sinless, it says it pleased God to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, but now shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Some may say, well, here it says the Lord bruised him, not Satan. But certainly it was the Lord that, if we could say it allowed Satan to do such. It was the Lord who really predestined it to be so. He hath no, but he says he put him to grief. We looked at this phrase last week. He shall make his soul an offering for sin, which, looking at the Hebrew there, it indicates that he was also covered our guilt in doing that. Right. You know, he not only took away our sin; he took away the guilt of our sin. He shall see his. It says, "When he, sh- when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed." He sees us through the offering of Christ, doesn't he? Right. When he, he doesn't look upon us in our sin, but rather he looks upon us through the person of Christ. He shall prolong his days. I think that re- refers to the eternality of Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly he died, but yet Revelation says. I am he which was dead when is alive and is alive forevermore. Christ has been, not only did he live, not only did he die, but yet he lives forevermore. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And Christ will fully accomplish that which is pleasing to God, that which God had purpose for him to do. That includes saving all those which are his. Verse 11 says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The travail means toil, trouble, labor. Certainly there was a lot of toiling in soul on the cross, wasn't there? As we'll get to, we'll see. He, he really he was in anguish both physically and spiritually. But here's a phrase that we didn't see in any of our study on the offerings and shall be satisfied. Mm-hmm. Certainly the offerings of the Old Testament were, in many cases, a sweet-smelling savor to God. They were acceptable to Him. Yet only the offering of Christ could He be satisfied. Remember, the sacrifices only rolled over their sins for a little time. They never could take them away permanently. Right. Yet in Christ... Our sins have been taken away forever. Mm -hmm. It's not that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, but yet the blood of Christ completely takes away for all of eternity. And by the death of Christ, by his offering, by his sacrifice, God has been satisfied. It says, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You know, through the knowledge of Christ is justification. 
doesn't mean a head knowledge of him. That's a, a spiritual knowledge of him. There's many people that know about the man we call Jesus, but they don't know him personally, do they? Right. Oh, but by knowing him, we shall be justified. Therefore, there is no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus. There's no more guilt to sin. There's no more punishment for sin. If we know Christ as Savior, for he shall bear their iniquities. Well, there's no other way, is there, but him bearing our iniquities? The, the law never justified anybody. Paul tells us that very plainly. No, no, the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't justify. They couldn't. They covered sins, if you will, but they didn't bear the sins. Right. Good works will not bear our sins. We and in ourselves, we like we can bear our sins, I guess, but they will be that will be for all of eternity if we do it that way. Right. In the place we call a lake of fire. Mm-hmm. No, Christ, when He bears our iniquities. They're gone forever, and we shall be justified in the sight of God. Verse 12 tells us, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This tells us that Christ would be great, wouldn't he? He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You know, he has a name which is above all names. It's because he has done that which God ordained him to do, because he has poured out his soul into death, he gave himself completely. Right. It says he was numbered with the transgressors. You see that fulfilled when he was crucified between two thieves. Mm-hmm. He was accounted as a wicked person, yet he was without sin. Right. And he bare the sin of many, and made tr- intercession for the transgressors. And we bore our sins. Does. And he's bore many s- people's sins throughout the past 2,000 years. And really, he bore them all on the cross, but we see it come to pass in time. <laughs> it says, and made intercession for the transgressors. He, this is fulfilled in two ways. One, he makes intercession for us even now. And certainly, I'm sure he did on the cross. But even on the cross, he prayed for those who crucified him. Right. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Christ made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for you and I. In fact, uh, I believe it's in Hebrews. Or, it said he ever, li- ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. Amen. Even now, he sat at the right hand of God making intercession for you and I that we may go to him for forgiveness of sin. I'm going to go on to our next place now in the book of Psalms, chapter 22. The Psalms actually talk quite a bit about Christ and his sufferings and his death. This chapter in particular, the, look at the majority of it. Some might say it's it's speaking of David, but the New Testament calls some portions of it directly a prophecy. I'm sure we could apply a lot of it to David and the circumstances he was in, but we can see it pointing to Christ just as well. Verse 1 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? This is not the very words of Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right. He said, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse 2 says, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I am not silent. I'm sure Christ seemed very, felt very alone there, didn't he? Right. He cried unto God, and yet it says he didn't hear him. In, on the cross he cried unto God in the garden he prayed unto God 
certainly God, I'm sure, could physically hear him, but he didn't effectively hear him, if you will. Because he became sin for us. He couldn't hear him. Verse 3 through 5, I think, point to him completely submitting himself to God. Because even though God didn't hear him, he says, But thou art holy. Mm-hmm. O thou that inhabitest, inhabitest the, praise of, or the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. So certainly, here God was able to deliver. I don't. I think God, if I can say it this way, had the ability to deliver Christ from the cross, but yet he couldn't in another sense because he would make himself a liar. He would. He had to fulfill that which was prophesied of him. He had to fulfill the eternal purpose of God. You know, people would mock him as we'll see here later because he trusted in God right. verse 6 says but I am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despise of the people this worm here can mean a maggot or a grub worm he was less than a man he says he was certainly treated less than human wasn't he certainly Christ was man though and that the fact that he was 100% man 100% flesh if you will and 100% God but he was treated less than a man. He, some had said this. Uh, this worm speaks of a scarlet worm. It said that that would attach itself to a tree to lay eggs, and would die. And in doing that, it would be covering the eggs to protect it. Right. Then it was give off. It says a crimson fluid that stained the body and the surrounding wood. Certainly a good picture of Christ, isn't it? That he died that we might have life. Exactly. That he he and the cross were stained with his blood. And we also thought here, and he said, but I am a worm and no man. The worms are trodden underfoot, and so was Christ. Certainly he was a man of no reputation, Philippians 2, 7 tells us. He was not a man highly esteemed among men. In fact, here it says he was a reproach of men and despised of the people. He was not that exactly well accepted among the people. Certainly, he had a following there for a little while, but when things got tough, most of them left, didn't they? In fact, when it came down to the arrest and crucifixion, they all forsook him. John was the only one close enough to even him be able to speak to him when he was on the cross. Let's go on to verse 7. Verse 7 says, And they shall laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And that was really the mocking of the those around the cross there. Right. He trusted in God. See if he'll deliver him. Mm-hmm. Certainly they laughed and mocked at Christ. The gospel tells us even that they wagged their heads as they mocked him. Here it says they shake the head. Verse 9 says, But thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Certainly he was God 100% even from the womb, wasn't he? <laughs> thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me to hope when I was upon my mother's breast. But we also see he was 100% man as well I often have wondered what the babe called Jesus was like he was a perfect baby certainly he didn't cry unnecessarily or throw fits or rebel as we often do I wonder how much he knew even as a baby though that's Something we could ponder on, but the scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot. We know by the time he was 12, he said, I must be about my father's business. Mm-hmm. Verse 10 tells us, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. What did a, the angel tell Joseph? He says, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Speaking of Mary. 
he was God from the womb, just as much as he was man. Really, we belong to God just the same at the moment of conception. I would argue that we belong to God from all eternity past, but in the process of time, it begins at our conception. Here's just another argument against abortion, but that's a topic we won't get on to right now. Verse 11 says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. There was not a single person that could help Christ when he was upon the cross. Right. You know, all his disciples had forsaken him, as we said. I don't even think Peter and all his, I don't know if you want to call it zeal or ambition that he had, could help him at that point. Right. Or it must be so that he would die there for us. But I'm sure from the perspective of Christ, it was a a very dreadful place to be, a very torturous place to be both physically and mentally that all had forsaken him that even God himself had forsaken him that's a concept we can't comprehend I don't think there is none to help me what a really what a state to be in verse number 12 we'll go on it says many bulls have compassed me strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round you know, the bulls, I think, refer to the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. They mm-hmm. had both literally and figuratively passed him about, surrounded him. Right. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. You know, the bulls of Bashan were known to be very well fed. Bashan was a very fruitful land. And for just for your knowledge, the half-tribe of Manasseh lived there in Bashan. Perhaps this refers to Herod and Pilate, as they having had more authority than the Jews did. They were the strong bulls of Bashan. It says they gaped upon me with their mouths, as a ravening and a roaring lion. Certainly, they. It seems to me to refer to when they were chanting out, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" You know, It says they were as a roaring lion. I don't know if you've ever been in a mob or I guess a large group where there's chanting going on. It's you could describe it as a raving, a raving and roaring lion. You don't want to be on the other end of it for sure. Along with those bulls of Bashan, uh, Amos chapter four verse one likens the cows of Bashan to those who oppress the poor and needy. Certainly they oppressed Christ both in his arrest and trial and crucifixion. Verse 14 says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. This describes really the utter misery of Christ's suffering. Right. He's poured out like water. He, you know, every last ounce of his being was used up. He said, all my bo- bones are out of joint. I can't imagine the the suffering that would cause. Right. But I'm sure there was lots of... You know, if you think about it on a cross, you're being pulled by your own body weight, almost being separated. All his bones were out of joint. He says, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. In a more literal sense, I'm sure his heart was heavy, for lack of a better word. It was very burdened with the sin that was upon him. In a more literal sense, I'm sure it was dried up almost, if you will, from the lack of blood. I'm no medical person, but if you let the heart run out of blood, it's going to keep pump or quit pumping. Verse 15 says, My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. And he was completely weak. If you know how dry a pot shirt is, 
that's clay pottery. There's no moisture in it whatsoever. Right. You know, when you make pottery, you bake it in the kiln and get all the moisture out. Because that's how dried up his strength was. Right. And literally, it was dried up too. He says, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. If you remember on the cross, he cried out, I thirst. Right. He was at the point of death here. That was brought me into the dust of death. It was shortly after he cried out, I thirst, that he yielded up the ghost. For dogs have compassed me, verse 16, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Dogs refer to wicked men. Sometimes even male prostitutes in particular, but other times more general, just men that are wicked. Certainly all around him was wickedness, wasn't it? The Jews, the Roman soldiers, the Pilate and Herod, all those that had surrounded him, they were all wicked men. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. It seems like the most, one of the most obvious prophecies of the cross, that they pierced his hands and his feet. They put the nails through his hands and his feet. Isn't, that's what uh, Thomas wanted to see, were the scars that as long as the, the piercing of his side where the soldiers came and stabbed him. Verse 17, we'll go on through verse 19 here, we'll stop at. It says, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. I'm sure he was so drained that so used up, he probably looked like skin and bones. Right. Almost shriveled up to nothing. He says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Well, this is directly quoted in the Gospels that the soldiers did this. That they parted his garments and they cast lots upon them. I'm sure they didn't know they were filling the scriptures, but yet they were. Verse 19 says, but, but be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Now, this is one last cry, and God certainly would deliver him and three days later. When he would rise from the grave and defeat death and hell and the grave. Right. Now, the rest of the chapter seems to speak more of David himself, but so we won't go on there. And for time's sake, I want to look at a, a few other places real quick, or at least mention them. Uh, some other prophecies concerning the sacrifice of Christ are Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. We can turn there real quick. This is, speaks of the sufferings of Christ immediately before the cross you know, during his arrest and trial <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair I hid not my face from shame and spitting Remember they whipped Christ. That's giving his back to the smiters. And he says, my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. Right. You know, it said that they plucked his beard. I don't, I don't remember the Gospels record that exact detail. But certainly they spit upon him and smacked him. And it says there, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Just the mockery that went along with all this. Right. And yet that was only the beginning of it. You know, Psalm 69 verse 21. This predicts, if you will, the, the giving of vinegar mixed with gall as his drink. Psalm 69 verse 21. It says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Psalms 34, verse 19 through 20 tells us. Well, I'll make one note here before we go there. I can't imagine being thirsty and getting vinegar to drink. Right. Vinegar, I 
not something I ever crave to drink, but I can't even imagine when I'm just completely dry and thirsty of getting it. It really just adds again to the mockery of Christ. Uh, Psalms 34, verse 19 and 20. Here tells that none of Christ's bones were to be broken. <coughs> Psalms 34, verse 19 and 20 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. It was customary that the Roman soldiers would come by and break the legs of the crucified so that they could die a little quicker and so they could stop pulling themselves back up, pushing themselves back up. And really it added to the torture as well, but when they got to Christ, he was already dead. Right. And really it was to fulfill this prophecy that not one of his bones was to be broken. You know, and all that, his nose wasn't broken, his fingers weren't broken, his... No, I've never suffered a broken bone other than the fact that they cracked my skull open to do brain surgery. But broken bones are common among humans, especially little kids. And yet, in all of Christ's life, in all of his beating and suffering, yet not a bone of his was broken. It says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Christ suffered greatly, but yet in the end the Lord delivered him out of it. In the end he rose victorious from the grave. Right. Last place we'll look at is uh, Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 10. It says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Now, this could apply to all of the Old Testament saints that he would not leave his soul in hell. This whole this hell is Sheol in the Hebrew, which was really where all of the Old Testament saints went, as well as the wicked. There was, if you remember the parable, or I don't know if it's a parable, but the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus was on one side of the gulf, and the rich man was on the other side. One side being called Abraham's bosom, the other, the flames. Well, that's where Christ went and preached the gospel during those three days that he was in the tomb. And I believe he took all the Old Testament saints with him on the glory when he rose again. But it says, I will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. This no doubt he speaks directly to Christ and his resurrection. If you remember the when Lazarus died. Christ showed up four days late or three days late. It was four days late, wasn't it? Yeah, four days. They said, well, behold, he stinketh. When Christ rose three days, you know, he hadn't got to the point of stinking yet. So he wasn't to see corruption. Right. So they, they prepared spices for him. By the time they got there, he was already raised. Christ rose again that he wouldn't see corruption that he in all things even in his death he would be perfect the Psalms 40 also speaks of the Christ, sacrifice of Christ but we're not going to go there uh, that's quoted directly in the book of Hebrews so we're going to look at it when we get there I guess that's going to wrap us up on the Old Testament next week we'll be shifting courses and looking at the New Testament our next lesson will be the sacrifice of Christ according to Matthew and Mark. Now, that primarily is contained in Matthew chapter 27 and Mark chapter 15, but you may look at some other passages as well. Do right. you have any questions before we close? All right, if not, then I, I guess we could call this our homework assignment. What, Look at the phrase there in the Christ on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I guess just kind of think about it a little bit, but also try to figure out why they said, Oh, you must call for Elias, which is Elijah. 
We'll talk about that next week. Alrighty.